the, the lectures for today and tomorrow, the big theme is many body quantum systems. Today, I'll be talking about their static properties, meaning analysis of the eigenvalues, not the spectrum, analysis of the eigenstates, and then what we can do with these eigenstates, is study the expectation value of some observables, and then study thermalization, you know, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So the focus is static properties today. And then tomorrow, more dynamics. Yeah, so how long does it take for these systems to reach thermal equilibrium? This is a more difficult question. And um, a little bit about many body localization and uh, self-averaging, okay? So I, I prepare uh, the, the lectures with slides because most of the discussions will be about um, numerical results. So then there'll be many plots and things like this. Um, I'm not going to teach you how to write the codes. Um, if you need help, then come and talk to me. I'm, I'm here during this whole week, and then we can try to write the codes together. But I'm going to be telling you what we can get once you have the codes ready, okay? All right, so um, let me move forward. Before I continue, just to, since I told you I'm not going to be teaching you how to write these codes, I just wanted to let you know that in my web page, you can reach this. I put the name there, and you can reach this web page by if you go to my Google Scholar, you, there is a link to this. So there is um, these tutorials that I put there. If you go there, the beginning has some um, uh, slides and things from group meetings. But if you move forward um, down in the page, you will see some lectures from two other schools, and uh, there are also codes. Uh, for for the the problems that I proposed in in this uh, in these um, schools, now the codes are in Fortran, right? Because I'm an old person, <laughs> and there are some codes in Mathematica as well. But um, they are explained. So if you want to write your codes in Python, you you follow the the explanations, and you you should be able. Okay, uh, and if you scroll down even more, you will find um, there are these two papers which are from that journal, American Journal of Physics, which is at a level for undergrads, and it's written with undergrad students. And there, again, we provide some codes, mostly with Mathematica there. And uh, what are these uh, papers about? Spin models, the ones that I'll be telling you about, uh, discussing symmetries of these models and discussing dynamics in these models, okay? All right, so what are these many body quantum systems? Well, systems with many particles, many quantum particles, and they are interacting. So we are thinking about many interacting particles and many degrees of freedom. Okay, so for those who want to discuss the DK model with me, I will not be presenting it here. Even though the DK model, which is this model to study superradiance, has many particles, it has just two degrees of freedom. So it's not going to be the focus here. We have no, many interacting particles and many degrees of freedom. Okay, and the examples. Well, nuclei, no heavy nuclei, molecules, well, quantum computers are many body quantum systems and the systems that we'll be discussing here. So what we have in mind are lattices. No? Um, so um, systems where we have many sites, on each site we have a particle and these particles are interacting. Um, what is different in these systems? Well, because of those interactions, they present some properties that you would not find in a system without interactions, like superconductivity or superfluidity. Well, in our case, we'll be exploring chaos, but chaos caused by the interactions between these particles and uh, thermalization, which is very much connected with the notion of chaos. Okay, so what is the problem with these um, many body quantum systems, no? if you want to study them? Most of them cannot be treated analytically. So we have to handle, um, do numerical simulations and that's what we'll be talking about here. And this is also hard and why? Suppose we have here, I, I made this drawing, no? oops, with this chain and on each side we have a two level system. Well. How, what is the size of the Hilbert space? If I have just two, uh, five sites, 
No, we'll have just 32. The Hilbert space is not that big. But if I double just 10, it's already a thousand. If I double, well, a million. No? So it increases exponentially with the system size. So doing this numerical analysis of these systems with enormous Hilbert space, well, we don't have enough um, resources for that. So if you are trying to do a scaly analysis, it gets really hard because you'll be playing with like four or five points. What kind of conclusion can we get from there? And uh, these systems may be too small, so you'll be getting finite size effects. So you may see some properties and you wonder, is this a real property, general property of this system or is just a finite size effect? So what is it that we can do? Well, we can develop quantum computers, right? Everybody's after that. But the ones that we have so far are not good enough. So what is it that we can do in the meantime? Well, you can think about new algorithms you know, that you can use in your classical computers. So this idea of um, matrix product uh, states, what is the idea behind? If you think about dynamics, for example, you know, we said that the Hilbert space is enormous, but it may not be instantaneous, that is, your system is not going to start in an initial state, it may not explore the whole Hilbert space instantaneously, it may go on exploring more and more of this Hilbert space gradually. And so these are algorithms that will take into account that you're not in the whole Hilbert space yet, you're just in a portion of it. And so these are um, uh, accessible methods. Uh, the other idea is the quantum simulators, and Mikhail already talked, uh, told us about in the morning, but I'm going to um, repeat a little bit more about them. So I, I, I selected three platforms for these quantum simulators. No? So these are experiments that are used to try to describe some systems that you're interested in, so experimental uh, platforms. So I put here the NMR, you know, nuclear magnetic resonance, because these are all the experiments and I think we tend to forget them because now we are so excited about cold atoms and ion traps. So I put them first because um, coherent evolution has been studied in NMR for a long time. What is the idea? They apply a magnetic field. So you have your um, nuclear spins um, aligned, you turn it off and you study relaxation. Yeah? And um, an advantage of NMR is that the experiments are done at room temperature. And you may wonder, and how about uh, this engineering of the Hamiltonians, no, this control that we have in cold atoms? Here, they also have some level of control. Um, they, they apply these pulses no, uh, that rotate the spins, and they have very smart uh, sequences of pulses that rotate some of the spins at uh, different angles so that they um, get rid of some unwanted interactions in the system and come up with um, a Hamiltonian, an engineered Hamiltonian. So let me give you an example. Um, there is this crystal, it's crystal fluorapatite. It's a, a, a system that uh, Paula Capellaro um, um, and some other people have been studying. What is the idea about this uh, crystal? The interaction is much stronger between the planes than on the plane. So this system is treated for a good time as a chain of spins half, which is the kind of system that we're talking about. Huh? Chains of spins half, but these systems usually, they have a, like a dipolar kind of interactions. Well, they can apply sequences of pulses and reduce these interactions for nearest neighbors. And so this is uh, one of the systems where Paula has studied many body localization. Okay, and then comes the other uh, systems that I think um, you're very well familiar with. No? The, the idea of uh, cold atoms in optical lattices. No? So you shine lasers in opposite directions, create those standing waves. So you have now the atoms in fixed positions. No? So it's a beautiful image it's as if you had a crystal made of light uh, and highly controllable. So you can control the range of the interactions, you know, the strength uh, can play with different geometries. Uh, and these are systems that are well isolated, so you can study coherent evolution for long times. Thermalization has already been studied in these kind of systems. And they can simulate spin models as the ones that we've been talking about. They can simulate Bose-Hubbard models, right? 
And the, the other one is ion traps. And then Michaela already told us um, about them in the morning. So that was very nice. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is, and I think Michael will be telling you more about this, no? the, the, what is so special about the experience with ion traps is that they can tune the range of the interactions as he was telling us, and they can go very close, not exactly, but very close to all to all couplings. And once we get to all to all couplings is a new scenario. No? So in this, um, because here we have a system of many interacting particles. So suppose we have our chain of spins half. No? So spin half here, spin half, and spin half. Nearest neighbor interaction. But now if you, if you go increasing the range of the interaction to the point that all of them are coupled with the same strength, then you don't have a many body system anymore. No? Now you have, instead of N spins half, now you have a big spin that is size N over two. No? So you went from a system that could be very complex, uh, chaotic system to suddenly a system that became uh, integrable, like one, one degree of freedom. So it's a nice thing to go on in this direction, I think. No? All the things that I'll be telling you about, start thinking, okay, but what happens if I start going to very long, you know, strong, uh, long range couplings? Okay. All right. So this is what I already discussed, some possibilities to analyze these many body quantum systems. Another one is, can we try to do something analytically? That's what I'm going to explore with you today. And uh, how can we do that? I'm going to start talking about full random matrices. What are these full random matrices? So these are matrices that are completely filled, and we are thinking about big matrices, completely filled with random numbers. I'll tell you more about them. And I think many of you already know about them anyway. And uh, the only constraint about this uh, matrix is that they should have the symmetries of the system that you're trying to describe. Now, a matrix completely filled with random numbers, of course, is non-physical. There is no real system described by a matrix filled with random numbers, correct? Um, I will show to you some um, matrices for real systems, and you will see them many, many zeros. Uh, and uh, you have no zeros just within a band. And even within this band, it, you have some sparsity. So nothing to do with these matrices completely, completely filled with random numbers. So you may wonder, why was Wigner using them? Uh, Wigner. Um, back in the 50s, used these random matrices a lot to try to describe statistically the spectra of heavy nuclei. Uh, whenever I talk about random matrices in an audience where there are mathematicians, they get upset because I put too much emphasis on uh, Wigner and they say, no, but uh, this is was studied since the 20s. It's true. <laughs> but for the nuclei is Wigner. And that's what we are talking about here in you know, these many body uh, systems. So, so the idea is, and this is back in the 50s, no, not even classical computers were uh, available there. So he was trying to get something analytically. No? So the idea is, instead of trying to write these matrices, take into account all these complicated interactions between the nucleons, let me fill it with random numbers. I know, of course, that this is not physical, but let's see how close or which properties I can get there that coincides with those from real um, nuclear. Okay. All right. So the idea is with these unphysical matrices, we can get analytical results. There are different kinds of random matrices. In this presentation, I'll be talking about matrices, random matrices that are real and symmetric. So they are the matrix from what we call Gaussian orthogonal ensembles, GOEs. No? So you have a time reversal invariance. But there are the kinds of random matrices. If it's just Hermitian, is the unitary ensemble. That is symplectic that I never use, maybe uh, some of you have. These first two are very common no, to describe uh, systems. I'll be focused on these ones because I'm studying these isolated systems where uh, my matrices are real and symmetric. There are other kinds of random matrices I'll mention there uh, later today, which are not completely filled. These are banded random matrices. 
There are many kinds as well there. And what is the purpose of these banded random matrices? This is what we are saying, not trying to get closer to these physical systems. Now, uh, I know you will have lectures about uh, driven systems. So now, when you're studying the driven systems, then you have these unitary matrices, and you also have uh, random matrices associated with them, but the circular ones. Okay, but so the focus will be the GOE in in this um, lecture. So, how can we get one of these matrices? Question. Yeah. Why is it just? Does it just happen that this GOE explains both lines of symmetry and the other symmetry? Can you explain it? Just happen. But anymore, if there is some explanation, why they should explain this kind of symmetry? Uh, it's the symmetry that the matrix has. No, if if it's real and symmetric, you have this uh, the, the rotation of symmetry. In the, in the matrix. If it's unitary, so it's a Hermitian kind of matrix, then you don't have a time reversal anymore. It, it, this is the, the symmetry that is a property of this kind of matrices. Okay. So I'm going to select the matrix according to the real system that I'm studying. Yeah. But in this uh, um, lecture, we are only going to talk about matrices that are really symmetric. The spin models that I'll be telling you about is all real um, elements and matrices that are symmetric. Yeah, so. Okay, so how we are going to build these uh, random matrices from the orthogonal ensemble? Very simple. You first you create a matrix, I'm calling it the matrix M there, and you put random numbers everywhere, random numbers from a Gaussian distribution, mean zero, and the variance you're going to choose. Well, usually we just put one. Huh? So you build this matrix, completely filled. And then what you do? You create the transpose of this matrix, add the two divided by two. Now you have a matrix that is real, and symmetric, okay? So what we have now, the mean of all the elements zero, and that this uh, variance, no, the, the second moment, is going to be in the diagonal, that uh, variance that we chose, so one in our case, of diagonals half. Um, let me tell you, these slides, I have, I can send to all of you, okay? So if, go on taking notes if, if this makes, um, it makes it easier to concentrate. I also take notes and then I can concentrate. But if you don't want, I, I send you the slides, okay? And also for those who are taking pictures, well, it's up to you, but just so you to know. All right, so now we have our um, random matrix. What we are going to do with that? So did you notice that I put random matrices with uh, like the dimension larger than a thousand to guarantee that we'll have good statistics. Even if I have just one random matrix, we'll have good statistics, okay? Uh, you could play with smaller random matrices, but then you have to do averages or play with these big ensembles. Just to see what I'll be telling you about, uh, or telling you about here, with one matrix, a thousand or more, uh, you see that you, you can get everything that I'm describing. Okay, so you have the matrix and you, ask for your code to diagonalize it. You know, give me the eigenvalues. And then with these eigenvalues, you make a histogram, you make a distribution. You're going to get this figure. You know? And uh, the envelope that I put here is a semicircle and the equation is there. So this dim that I wrote here is the dimension of the matrix that we, we built. Okay, And you can check that you really have this um, uh, shape and that this equation fits well your distribution. Okay? So there you are, my, my first exercise for you. If you want to do it during this week, do it. So then we, we can check. I can also give you data that I have and we can compare if you, if you got it, yeah? So uh, it's just that, check that you really get the semicircle, put this curve there, check this um, edge values and, and see that everything matches. An excellent book to study random matrix is Meta's book. Okay, everything is there. 
त्यामुळे you will get the semi circle as well you can check okay but um yeah if you want to do that do it and then we can compare all right so this is the just raw eigenvalues put them all there and make the histogram what else can we do with these eigenvalues we can study level statistics and what is the idea um, here we have the spectrum, of course, a thousand numbers, né? and we are going to pick the spacing between neighboring levels. So the spacing E2 minus E1, E3 minus E2. So we collect all of these spacings now, and we are going to make our distribution with these spacings. And you will get, I'm going to refine what I'm saying here, but what you will get is a curve that looks like this red curve which is the Vigna-Dyson distribution. So you see that there is this S showing up in the spacing no? in this distribution. If S is zero, the distribution is zero. So that's what you're seeing here. No? What this plot is telling us is there is no spacing zero. So you don't have two levels together. You don't have the genesis. You don't have crossings. No? So these eigenvalues, they are very much correlated they repel each other. You know? So it's like they're aware of each other. So the spectrum gets rigid. Okay, That's the story. But I didn't tell you the whole thing. It's not really just picking the spacings. We have to unfold the spectrum. People get afraid of the unfolding, but it's no big deal. I'm going to show to you a very simple method to unfold the spectrum. You know, people try to avoid unfolding, but... I think it's good for you to know that it's no big deal. So what is what does it mean to unfold the spectrum? You're going to remove from the spectrum um, properties that are specific to the system that you're trying to study. What you want to know is the fluctuations, no? not the specific properties of each system. So to unfold, and this I learned with Israelev, this simple method to unfold, this was in 2003. No, so Israel Lab is one of these old guys um, studying chaos. Um, the idea is here. If you want, I can write on the board. But um, so you have, so it's like a, a recipe. Yeah? You have uh, the levels ordered from the lowest to the highest. So that's uh, item one. Item two, get rid of the levels that are at the edges of this spectrum because they usually have a, a lot of fluctuation. So what we do is like a 5% or 10% of the levels at the edge, so we just throw them away. All right, now what survives, all the levels that survives, we are going to break them into small sets. What I put here is, I, I said, let's make sure that in each set of this spectrum, we have 10 spacings, just 10. Usually when I do this, I, I, I use just six spacings, but 10 just to make a, a round number. No? So that means from level one to level 11 is my first set. So I, I have 10 spacings. The next set from 11 to 21, 10 more and so on. Okay, so let's look at one of these sets. We have those 10 um, spacings. What we are going to do is compute the mean value of them. So I'm going to write down, but this is very simple. Yeah. So I have the spacing, this tenth spacing, and then the second spacing, all the way to that one that is uh, E2 minus E1. Yeah, so and then I get the mean of this. Okay, so this is the mean um, spacing, which at the end is very simple. No, it's what we are doing here is just the, the, the edges. E11 minus E1 divided by 10. Okay, once we did that, then instead of playing with those spacings that I told you in the beginning, those raw levels, you play with the new ones. 
divided by this mean. So this will guarantee that the mean level spacing now is one. Okay. So that's the unfolding procedure. So you see, it's very simple. Okay, so now you <laughs> turn it on, you can turn it off. Yeah. So we are going to be playing with these rescaled spaces, and that will give you the a nice Vigna Dyson if the system uh, really has le level repulsion. Okay. Okay. Yes. In, in, in real life, you know, people do uh, ensemble averages. Since I'm just proposing some exercises, I'm saying even if you have a matrix with a thousand levels, just this will give you already a nice Vigna dice just for you to check. But in real life, yes, you're going to be doing different realizations of these random matrices and doing averages. Yeah. And then, but then you do this um, uh, unfolding for each realization. Yeah. Before that, you said that uh, this IML distribution which is on the so uh, for the small matrix, uh, you calculate uh, for say a thousand of matrix, you calculate uh, eigenvalues. And if you plot uh, the eigenvalue density plot, then you will get that. Uh, the semicircle. Yeah. So uh, is this true for uh, every observable we, uh, we calculate? Means suppose you calculate something with eigenvectors. So uh, the in property or something. So. Uh, well, in that case also, is it true that uh, for a small matrix, you calculate for the uh, support granny problem, and you take that average over 1,000 of matrices. So that answer, and for a bigger matrix, so is, is it equivalent over there also? So, so then you're thinking about the structure of our eigenstates, I'll come to them. Right, I think, because you're talking about Rennie entropy of these eigenstates, perhaps. And then you are asking, if I had a tiny matrix, what kind of eigenstate I have? Is it comparable to doing an average? Or, or if I do an average here, if you would get a equivalent to this um, big matrix. Well, look, what we have here is a matrix with random numbers, okay? What I'll be telling you later is, you diagonalize, you have these properties for the spectrum, and the eigenstates, they're just random vectors. But if you do with the tiny matrix, it would be hard for you to realize that these are really random vectors. I think if you do ensemble averages, yes, but um, the, we have in mind many body systems. So that's why I'm diagonalizing big matrices and I'm thinking about big vectors, yeah? But I think once you are playing with random, matrices, the properties should follow for short, for small or large. Not at all once we go to physical models, yeah. Why do we get to collapse them together and make this complete? Why they get cluster, you said? This, I don't know, this unfolded space, and why do we need to do that, like, state in and why we to... Okay, because each, each system that you pick will have some, um, properties of its own. One way that I try to explain this is, suppose I have the spectrum of my physical system. If, if, if you look at this plot, that I, this drawing that I made here, you see the middle of this spectrum, many, many levels close. And here you see this, the levels, uh, they look more separated. And then you could just, by looking, and you could say, oh, I think this region is the region where they are, there is stronger repulsion. It's not. The, this region is just the region with fewer levels. Yeah? If, you do, if you do this unfolding, so you guarantee now that the mean level spacing is one, you remove these properties that are um, self-properties of the spectrum, and you're going to be checking just the fluctuations. And you will see just the opposite, that the largest repulsion is actually in the middle. There was another question. Yeah. 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 Why do we uh, just be like, winning things? Like, you know, smaller sets, one smaller sets, and then put the eigenvalues with that. Like 11, 10 sets. I was doing that because it's an easy way to guarantee that the mean level spacing will be one locally for each one of these sets. Okay. Uh, 
and suppose maybe maybe we make the same like once on the right. You always have to do this unfolding because you, you want to extract, take out the, the properties of that specific spectrum that you're studying. If you pick different systems, okay, each system has its own, um, we call the smooth properties of the spectrum. We are trying to get rid of them and we just want to see how it fluctuates around these smooth um, uh, functions and each system that you study has a different smooth function because ah ah okay because of what I because of what I said here yeah but uh, still uh, we have a thousand or ten thousand levels and in these ten thousand levels you you will find different uh, behaviors in different regions of this spectrum and also different systems have different um, the global uh, like average you get the same instead of you know clubbing them into 10 suppose I look at the, the global mean okay so the global is the real unfolding um, I was pr providing you a simple method for them for the the, the the real one let me fast forward where is it <laughs> okay so this is the real unfolding procedure. So I, I was not even going to tell you this, but let's go. What we do here is you go energy by energy and you say, okay, up to 700, how many levels do I have? And you mark up to 701, how many levels? So you create this stair um, uh, function that we call, no, the, yeah, so did you understand? So we just go on counting how many levels we have up to energy 700, how many levels we have up up to 700.5 and so on. So you, you create this, um, this curve. So this is the real unfolding procedure. Now, with this curve, you're going to do a polynomial fit. And uh, this fit is the smooth part of your spectrum. So this fit here is specific of each spectrum that you have, of each system that you have. But apart from this fitting, you have the fluctuations around. What we want to study is these fluctuations around. Okay. So for the whole spectrum, then you have to do this thing properly, uh, check this um, um, polynomial fit. And then it's no big deal again. But uh, then if you want to do it really carefully, uh, then there are discussions. Oh, is it the polynomial of order five or is it of order four? So there are these kind of discussions. Okay. But once you did this, you're going to, instead of playing with those raw eigenvalues, you'll be playing with the rescaled eigenvalues. And then you will remove what is specific to the system. You'll be studying just the fluctuations, okay? You can do that, but if, you, if your purpose is only check, is there repulsion or not, that simple method that I told you is already good enough. Okay, so let's come back to that. Okay, so this is uh, the simple unfolding procedure. Tell me. What percentage? We discovered it dependent on the system. I usually do ten percent. Okay, that is that that is arbitrary. Just get rid of the guys at the edge. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. Then we, after doing that, we'll have our, if the system has level repulsion, if we are playing with a random matrix, you'll get the Wigner Dyson distribution. And here's an example. This uh, curve that you're finding here is from a real heavy nucleus and you see very good agreement. And so great, people then extended this idea to other complex systems, atoms, quantum dots, and so on. Now, this is, uh, random matrices and this analysis for heavy nuclei was back in the 50s. Beginner was not talking about quantum chaos. Nobody was talking about chaos in the 50s. No? The story about quantum chaos comes much later in the 80s. And uh, for those who, who know about what I'm saying, uh, there is this paper by Bohegans, which is um, 
very much uh, mentioned. There is even a, an earlier paper, 1980 by Cassati, also discussing this connection now with chaos, real chaos in the classical system, and level repulsion in the quantum domain. So what are these papers from the 80s? Now they are not playing with many body systems. They are not thinking about nuclei. What they are studying here are billiards. Okay. So the billiard in the classical limit, if the billiard in the classical limit is chaotic, what, what does chaos here mean is what you use uh, to, no? extreme sensitivity to the initial conditions, uh, Lyapunov exponent that is positive, mixing, no? filling the, the phase space. So this is chaos. Then if you would study this billiard now in the quantum domain, no? a micro, a small billiard, in the quantum domain, the eigenvalues of that, then they saw that they would get the Wigner Dyson distribution. On the other hand, if the classical system was not chaotic, the Aponov exponent zero, they would analyze the spectrum in the quantum domain, no more Wigner Dyson, you would get this curve, which is Poisson curve. What is it telling us? That uh, now the levels can cross. No, these levels are uncorrelated. Okay. So they established this connection between chaos in the classical limit and properties of the spectrum. So this is what people started calling quantum chaos. Some people at the time would call quantum chaology. No, they were uh, uh, disturbed about this term quantum chaos. Nowadays we use it without much thinking, but they were disturbed about that. No? But is this connection. So what we are calling quantum chaos are properties of the spectrum in the quantum domain that tells us what you should expect in the classical limit. So you, you see the quantum system, oh, there is level repulsion. Ah, I go to the classical limit, I have positively a exponent. Okay. You look at the, uh, the classical system and then you look at the corresponding quantum Hamiltonian. Exactly. So for the billiard, you look at the, you know, the, the, the dynamics that is being generated by, so there's a single particle which is going around and getting hit by all these scatters. Exactly. So look at the Hamiltonian and the diagonalize and look at the exactly, particle. exactly. No? So and it's a single particle. Exactly. And that's what I, I, I want to emphasize now. So this is the kind of analysis that you can do positions with few degrees of freedom. You can study the classical limit. Huh? So this was checked for billiards. This was checked for kick rotor, uh, like the DK model that I mentioned to you, which is a system with two degrees of freedom. You can do this analysis, quantum and classical. You can go back and forth and uh, do this game. Now we are talking about systems with many degrees of freedom, not these many body uh, systems. It's, Tell me. If we consider the perfect separate study and uh, functional video, then it is integral within the classical memory. So I expect the force on you, You're talking about this, this figure here. So the, the, the billiard here is the um, rectangle. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, yeah, the, the, the billiard system without the, the, the obstacle in the center. Uh -huh. and if the, it's regular, then if you go to the quantum domain, Poisson. Yeah, yeah. And so, then the, if we modify the, the part itself a little bit, then the in classical system, it is no integral. Right. So it, is a, it gives a weak chaotic system. Uh -huh. So what, you know, what is the distribution? If we can get a, a weaker distribution. OK. Um, I I, I I I don't know the weak chaos, but uh, what we have in many systems, we have something between Poisson and Wigner Dyson. You can have that. Okay. You can. Yeah. I don't know about this specific uh, one, what you get, but uh, you will see, um, I'll be showing to you distributions in between. There's no sudden change at the no, no, no. And that's another question. Um, is this a transition or is it a crossover? Okay, um, I'm going to go later into this, but for the many body systems that we study, there is like a parameter that you are changing and you can go smoothly from the Poisson all the way to the Wigner dice. But what you also see is that as you start increasing the system size, the range where you've got a very big, good Wigner dice starts increasing as well. Yeah, 
but um, is there any other? Yeah. Okay, so there were some uh, semi classical studies, then the name behind is Goods Wheeler, trying to connect um, um, the levels with uh, the properties of the classical system. I think so. And that is very mathematical kind of thing. Okay, so coming back to the many body systems. Well, once we have many body, well, studying the classical limit starts getting very complicated. And there are some cases of many body systems where the classical limit is not even well defined. If you think about the spin half system that we'll be talking about, this is super quantum. No? There is no classical, well defined classical um, uh, limit for this um, spin halves. So, what are we going to do with our many body systems? What we've been doing, and I'll be doing this in this lecture, I'll say, oh, if I get a big Dyson, my quantum system, without studying the classical a limit for the quantum, I'll say that it is chaotic, okay? You don't need to agree with that, and not everybody agrees. We do that all the time, but there are some people who are skeptical, okay? I'll be calling it chaos here. I think that's uh, I think what my next slide is saying, yeah? So if I get these level statistics as in random matrix, without doing the classical analysis, I'll say that the system is chaotic. If this bothers you and it bothers some people, you can just say, okay, uh, we are studying level statistics, we are studying level repulsion, we are studying spectral correlations. I'm calling this chaos. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, what disturbs some people about that. Okay, now, uh, what he was asking, you know, can we have something in between? We can, we, when we are studying real systems, you can have something that will give us the Poisson, something that will give us the, the Vigna Dyson, and even distributions in between. So some people came up with, um, like Brody came up with uh, an expression like this, so that we can associate a number to each one of these distributions that we get. So that's very convenient. You know, we, are, we are trying to study the transition from one side to the other. We have a number for each. So what is this distribution um, telling us? If beta is zero, yeah, so then we don't have the S here. We have the Poisson. If beta is one, we have the S from the Vigna Dyson distribution. Yeah. So you have your distribution and you try to fit uh, with this curve and try to find what is the beta that is the best for your curve. Uh, if it was zero, you say, okay, I have Poisson. If it's one, oh, Vigna dies. If it's something in between, well, I'm in an intermediate scenario. Okay. So this is the distribution by um, Brody. There is another one I just want to mention to you. Uh, this is from Zrylev. It's, it's another equivalent kind of equation. But with this one, when you do the fitting with this one, this uh, beta parameter can go also to the unitary ensemble, the symplectic one. Okay? But usually we don't need that anyway, but just for you to know. All right. Now, um, I went through the all this discussion about unfolding, but there are quantities that you don't need to do unfolding. That's very convenient. So, and th that's why this became so fashionable on the ratio of consecutive spacings. Right? So now we are doing the spacing n, n minus one, divided by n minus one, n minus two. So consecutive spacings. And with this one, you don't need to do unfolding. So in a way, it's similar to, what we are talking about here, because I was dividing by this, yeah? So, but I, I was dividing by this whole uh, set. Now here we are doing the consecutive spaces. And there are distributions for them, again, uh, when you have level repulsion or not, and associated with each one, we can get a number, which is this minimal value between these two um, consecutive spaces. This number of Vigna Dyson, this number of Poisson. So it's the same story, but now you don't even need to think about unfolding. So this is very simple. And there again, I put for you as an exercise, try to compute this mean value uh, for this uh, tilde. Yeah. In the endometrial case, there is a very dense matrix. And yeah. you're calculating the eigenmeasure, the eigenmeasure, and the eigenmeasure property. 
There is a problem, and uh, how are you uh, seeing this same structure of this level spacing in a very sparse matrix and in different? Yeah, it's it's impressive, right? That uh, I always, when when I started learning about random it was fascinating. I said, "Well, such a simple idea and works so well," but we are studying the fluctuations. We are not studying the specific properties of the spectrum, just the fluctuations. So also for these sparse cases, we'll see that these fluctuations match these random matrices. But then you'll see many features that will start becoming uh, specific for the system that you're studying. In this, these physical systems, um, if you look at um, different portions of your spectrum, you will see, for example, that at the edges, if you would try to do um, these distributions for the lowest levels, you will not get chaos. And so you will, you will start seeing that real chaos as in random matrix is for the middle of the spectrum in these many body systems. And so once we go real, then there are specific properties of each system. But what is um, general in these physical systems, middle of the spectrum looks very much like that, even though they are very sparse, yeah. Okay, um, all right, so what we talked about so far are just level space distribution, or ratio of consecutive levels, they detect short range correlations. Now we are talking about neighbor. If you want to do a, a complete analysis of the spectrum, we can look at quantities that detect also long range, no? so not to, level one and two, but what happens between level one and 10 or one and 20? One of these quantities is known as level number variance. For this one, you really have to do the unfolding well done, not the, the simple one that I told you. No, you have to see the global thing as we are talking about. But what is this level number variance? We have the spectrum and you're going to break it into segments again um, of size L. Now we are going to be varying this L, but fix L, okay? And we go in each uh, piece here, you compute to the variance. That's the level number variance, okay? Then you increase this L, compute this, this variance again, okay? Well, you have averages because you have many segments. And uh, so this is the plot of the level number variance as a function of this size that we selected. If you had Poisson, as you increase the L, the levels, uh, the variance grows linearly because uh, these levels are uncorrelated. But if you have that structure, that rigid spectrum, it grows uh, slower, it follows this logarithm behavior. So this is a way to detect not just short, but also long range correlations. And why this could be important? Well, I said you have to do proper unfolding. Huh? But here, I'm showing to you a system. Uh, well, look at the Hamiltonian if you know what it is, but if you don't, it doesn't matter. There is a parameter here, this T prime, that as we increase, we start getting good chaos, we start getting good Wigner Dyson. So you see this 0 0.06, it's not really on the red curve yet. But then if I pick point. 12 or 16, it looks like very good Wigner Dyson. No? So it looks like, oh, I have very good uh, rigid spectrum. Tell me. Can you again explain what is N L the, the, the Hamiltonian you said? No, no. Ah, okay, okay, let me come back. Yeah. So the L is, I have my spectrum, okay, let's say a thousand levels. So then I'm going to break it in like a segment 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, okay? And I, inside this 0 0.5, I compute the variance. No? So I have some um, numbers there. We are computing um, the mean of the square and the square of the mean of the numbers there. But we have many of these segments. So I do an average here and I get a number. So, so for uh, 0 0.5, I got a number and then I increase, I go one and do the same thing, variance for each piece and then two, variance for each piece. Okay. And uh, and then you have this whole plot here. 
All right. So this is a system that as this T prime increases, I get um, the system becomes chaotic. Yeah. Right. So, uh, for P time 0.06 in the first law, I think that the system size that you're it's not uh, fitting very well to the Gaussian, right? Vignatized, it's not. Yeah. No, it, so it's. it's yes, well. exactly. That's what I was saying. Oh. Yes. And, and we, we studied that as a dependence on system size, and you see it getting better and better, which gives us the impression that an infinitesimal. Uh, integrability breaking uh, would be enough. Much, uh, idea of carrying yeah, probably. Yeah. But, yeah. So it looks more like a real transition, not a, as a crossover. Okay. But coming back here, then I don't know if I look at uh, point 16. Well, I would say it's a very good Vigna dice. But if I look at the level number variance, point 16 is here, you see? Like uh, up to some length, it's showing good um, rigid spectrum, but not beyond. And so I had to go to 0.64 to, to get a spectrum that is as rigid as random matrix. So it's until 5, no, what is it? 5.30. Okay, so let's keep track. All right. Now, there is another quantity that became super fashionable recently that detects short and long range. Everybody's talking about it, which is the spectral form factor. And so what is the spectral form factor is this. Is the sum of these faces, you see it's not just neighbors. I'm putting here all levels, 1 and 10, 1 and 20. No? And uh, so what is this? Is the Fourier transform of this two-point spectral correlations. Uh, you see that I also divided by D here. D is the dimension of my Hilbert space. So with this quantity, I'm saying we are going to detect short and long range correlation. But let's talk a little bit more about this quantity. Um, when T, T here is time. When T is zero, you know, because I put this normalization here, I start at one. Now let me open this double sum like this. I have this term when alpha and beta are different, and this is the term when alpha and beta are equal. So it's just the dimension. No? It's just the sum of ones. So then what we have is this term, alpha and beta different. So this is the term that is changing, and this is a constant. We are thinking about big matrices, right? So we are thinking about many, 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 many different phases here, which means like sums, big sums of cosines with different frequencies. So as this time becomes large, these things will average out and will give us just tiny fluctuations. Around what? This number. Is this clear to everybody? Yeah? So we are going to start this quantity here. It starts at one, but at long times, this term becomes tiny fluctuations and we are going to end at this one over D. So this is this horizontal line that I marked. Okay, so we know the beginning and the end. What happens in between? So we are summing these cosines. As time increases, this thing is decaying. But it decays in this uh, random matrix. You will see that it goes below that line, and then it goes up again and it goes up following this ramp. Okay, so this ramp is a feature that only appears if the system is chaotic, if we have level repulsion as in random matrices. So this ramp is what people are now calling uh, a, a good signature of quantum chaos in many body systems. And there are many studies of that. It's not new, okay? This thing is super old. You can, you can find these discussions in um, uh, Meta's book as well. But uh, now it became very fashionable. Any questions? No. Then you don't have the ramp. Yeah, so then integrable models are, are complicated things. You can think it, you will see some case that it shoots down, but you will never get this nice ramp. Okay. Um, it's happening due to 
correlated levels, correlated eigenvalues, correlated as in random matrices. So it's short and wrong range. Every, everything is correlated. Yeah. Good question. I hope I will be able to tell you this uh, tomorrow when I start talking about many body localization. But the idea is, suppose I have some kind of parameter that um, depend on this value, I have good level of repulsion as in random matrix. So I have my nice ramp there. And I start changing this parameter, so I start killing the correlations. We kill first the long range. And what we'll see is that this is, the ramp is starting here. As I start killing my correlations, you will see it starting later and later until it disappears. And the, the time when the ramp starts can tell you a lot about this, about uh, what kind of correlations you have there mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the destruction of these correlations. When I'm turning the parameter, I'm killing all the correlations. But the the first ones that I see disappearing are the long range, and okay. So and then the thing is getting postponed, postponed until there is no ramp anymore. Yeah, so there is, for random matrix, all this is analytical. We have an equation to describe the ramp. And that's, that's what we were talking about. Oh, how about an integrable model? Can you go below that saturation point? You can, but you're not going to see this ramp that is given analytically by random matrix. Okay? Thanks. It's going, it's going directly. How it goes, it will depend on the symmetries of the system. Okay, but, but it, it's a ramp, it, start, it starts linearly, but at the end, here it may have some other behavior, but it starts a nice linear behavior. Because it has to fit to these two boundary values. So where do the, the I mean where do correlations play a role? If it was an integrable model, you could just see this decay, some oscillations and 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 flat and saturation. But it won't uh, you know you, you want it won't have this nice ramp. Okay, so now I'm going to try to give you an idea of you won't have I didn't I didn't it, it took a hubber model you said? No. R, R, R the R. And, 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 and point thirty nine. Uh-huh. I'm asking that which is uh Okay, if you got the point 53, that's a sign that you have a nice Wigner Dyson distribution that is chaos. And then if you pick those eigenvalues and you look at this quantity, you will see a nice ramp. Now, if your R was 0 0.39, that indicates that you have a Poisson. You could even look and check, I have a Poisson. Then you come here, you're not going to see this ramp. That is integrable, okay? Now, if you have something in between, you will see a smaller ramp happening at longer times. In, in this lecture, I'm talking about Poisson distributions. Okay, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Okay, good. All right, so um, I'm going to try to give you an idea of where this ramp comes from, but look at Meta's book if you want the details, okay? All right, so um, this is the term that is giving us that behavior in time. This is a sum. Instead of a sum, I'm writing this integral, yeah? So it's an integral with this delta function. So if I solve this delta function, I go back to my, my sum. 
Okay, but you see that uh, we are doing averages here. No, we are doing averages over ensembles. So I'm going to compute the average of this delta function that is in this integral. So the average of this delta function will come with these probabilities. Um, we are talking about two-point uh, functions, right? So we are going to integrate out all of the other levels, and I'm going to focus just on E alpha and E beta. So I integrated the, the rest, and we got this prefactor. So what survives from this integral is now just a double integral in E alpha and E beta. And these are two that we are finding here is the probability that we are finding a level around E alpha and E beta. So the story of the ramp is contained in this guy. These are two, uh, this uh, two point correlation function contains two terms. One term is the R1, as you will see in Meta's book. What is the R1 is the one point uh, uh, correlation function. What is that? Just the density of states that we saw before is the semicircle, okay? So this is the R1. The T2 term contained in this R2 is the cluster function. This is the one that appears when we have correlated levels. Well, let's go step by step. So let's focus first on this guy, okay? This, as we said, is just density of states. We already know it's a semicircle. So we have this uh, density of states, two, you no? Know? I'm going to bring it back here. So what we have now is three integrals, yeah? So I'm just thinking about the R1. We have the integral. This first integral, then we have the average for the delta function. So we have this R1 in E alpha, the R2 in E beta, right? And now these two other integrals. And this is R1. Yeah? So we said that this is just the density of state. And, uh, uh, and we have the delta function that I forgot to put here. And so this is what we get with this term. So you see what we have now is very simple, no? Because if you do this delta function, we are going to have this, this uh, part here. No? So if you do the delta function, we'll have one negative exponential and the other one, the, the positive. No? So it's the absolute value square of the, the density, the, the absolute square of the Fourier transform of the density of states. That's the first part. So what we care with this first part is just the envelope of our distribution. So you, you don't care about uh, the discreteness of the spectrum, you're just looking at the envelope. Huh? And if you do that Fourier transform of the semicircle, you get this J1 here is the Bessel function of the first kind. So this guy here is explaining to us this decay and these oscillations that you are seeing here. These oscillations come from the Bessel function. Okay, uh, and uh, these oscillations are interesting because it's telling us there are the zeros of the delta, uh, of the of the Bessel, no? So it tells us that there are points where we go really to zero. Okay, now, what is going to explain this ramp is that on that part, which is now detecting the correlations among the, the eigenvalues. No? So if we go, if we go here to longer times, no? if we give enough time, uh, this, the, the, the dynamics, now we'll finally detect that the levels are discrete. It's not just the envelope, they are discrete. And in our case of random matrix, they are correlated. It's from this D2, if you do the Fourier transform of that, that you get this B2 function. And this B2, let me just show the next slide. 
is given here. This came from Meta's book. This is the guy that explains the, the ramp. Okay? So if you if you get your curves no, and you, you don't get any agreement with this B2, well, you don't have correlations. No? The, the B2, this ramp, is the correlations coming from random matrices. Okay? The D2 you get from the vendor mode? In the, in the random matrices, you have that uh, cluster uh, function that shows up. Oh, there, right? Here is the connected part of the spectrum. Hmm? So this you get from because for random matrices, the joint probability distribution of all the eigenvalues is known. So you use that to get the yes, point. exactly. You know that. Yeah? But then, if your if your real physical system has a, a spectrum that is almost it will never be equal, but almost as rigid as random matrix, you will see that. It will also follow that ramp. Okay. Now, question. Yeah. Ah, uh, the, uh, you are seeing these these fluctuations here, right? Ah, okay. Before the the oscillations. Okay, the oscillations are just what you get from Bessel functions. You make a, a plot of a Bessel function, you will see it goes up and down like that. And then there are those fluctuations showing up later, which we can reduce if we do big averages, if we increase the matrix and so on. I didn't tell you this yet. I'll tell you more. I was planning to tell you more about it tomorrow. But to see this nice ramp, you have to do averages. Because uh, I'll tell you later, there is no self-averaging for this quantity. But I'll tell you more about it tomorrow. Huh? Ah, good question. Good, this this big gamma here. I should. I'll tell you much more about this later. But this gamma is the width of this distribution. Okay, which in the case of random matrix is uh, related to the dimension of the matrix. And then when we go to real systems, you will see how it changes. There will be this gamma showing up also. But now it's not going to be proportional to the dimension of the matrix. Since the real matrices are very sparse and banded, that gamma will show up, but it's proportional to the size of the chain. But we'll talk more about that. This is a good question. So, this was analytical. Yes, yes, uh, yes. The fluctuations at the end. Okay, so but this is this is fine. Um, remember, we are studying these guys, right? So if you go large time, you have this big sum of cosines, each one with a different frequency. Huh? So this gives us these fluctuations at at the end after we got the saturation. This gives us these fluctuations. That's what I'm saying. If you make your matrix bigger and bigger, these fluctuations. Uh, should decrease, but you also have to do averages, averages, averages over different ensembles. Then you can make it smaller. Okay? But these are just fluctuations coming from this sum of many cosines with different frequencies. So the density of things like that, so uh, I mean, that can be very different. I mean, do it, but this one doesn't. The, the quantity is not. And it's not self-averaging. I will tell you more about it at any time scale. OK, since I don't know how much I'll be able to tell you tomorrow, so since the questions are coming, let me already uh, tell you a little bit. So this quantity is not self-averaging. Uh, so you have to do big averages. Even increase the matrix, you have to keep doing these averages. OK, so lack of self-averaging is that. Increase, well, let me say the opposite. Self-averaging is, as I increase the size of the matrix that I study, if it is self-averaging, that means I can reduce the number 
of um, disorder realizations that I'm using. I can. But if it's non-self-averaging, which is the case of this quantity, you increase the matrix, and you have to keep doing big averages, which is a, a problem, no? because you have a matrix now much larger, and you have to do many diagonalizations to see this nice ramp. What we found out in some paper with Edway, who is here, is how can we circumvent this problem of having to do big averages by opening the system? Okay, so if we open the system, which is a bit counterintuitive, opening the system, when you're talking about quantumness, it's always bad. You know, you're going to lose coherence and all. But if you open a little bit, you can gain, gain the average through the environment. And I'll tell you more about it uh, tomorrow. Okay, But non-self-averaging, you have to do these big averages. Okay, now this is just a history in this story. Um, most of the recent papers call this feature RAMP. RAMP, I don't think, is a very informative name. Uh, the community understands, but if you get out of this community, nobody knows, I think, what RAMP is. But the same studies of uh, this RAMP was done since the 80s. And the, these papers are not much cited nowadays, but... What, are, what, are, what were these people doing? They were trying to study um, level statistics, but of molecules. So molecules, you don't have such good line resolution as you have in nuclei. Now in nuclei, you have good line resolution, so you can do that level space and distribution as we talked. In molecules, you may have some overlaps. So the idea of those guys is, well, let's do the Fourier transform. And with this Fourier transform, they would still detect that well, thing below the saturation, which they started calling correlation hole. Yeah. So I think the most appropriate name nowadays would be correlation ramp. Yeah. But uh, I, I think it's nice to know that these works exist as well. Okay. So they were doing analysis of the spectra of uh, systems that did not have good line resolution, but with this Fourier transform, they could still detect the correlations. And there were many papers uh, back in the 80s and 90s all using this term correlation hole. So that's why I use also, <laughs> not to give credit to these people. Okay. So I don't know, maybe you could use both terms, ramp or correlation hole. No? So everybody gets happy. Um, some um, advantages of using uh, the correlation hole or the ramp to detect um, level statistics. We already said, no? it detects um, uh, short and long range, everything is there together. It does not need to be, uh, we don't need to do unfolding. There are two other um, advantages, which I'll tell you soon, which is you will see the whole, even if the system has symmetries. Symmetries is a problem if you're trying to detect level statistics. Um, uh, you have to take the symmetries into account, but with the correlation hole, even if you have symmetries, you will you will see it showing up. Okay. All right. Now comes the story about the eigen states that you had asked. Okay. Um, if we diagonalize this random matrices, we saw that the eigenvalues, this no? so the the levels are correlated. So the correlations are in the spectrum. But if you look at the eigenstates, you will see that the, the components of these eigenstates are completely uncorrelated. No? So correlations in the levels, uncorrelations in the eigenstates. What do I mean? The eigenstates have many, 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 many components, no? the size of the, the matrix, and all of them are just random numbers. No? So we have just random vectors. So you see, that's the what makes random matrices uh, easy to deal with. The eigenvalues are correlated. There are books, Meta's book about these correlations. It's all well known. And the eigenstates, just random vectors. Yeah. So random vectors, no, uh, random numbers as in um, Gaussian random numbers, but with the constraint, of course, that you have to have normalization. And so uh, uh, the mean is of this uh, Components is zero, 
uh, the mean of the square is the one over the dimension to guarantee normalization. And, uh, the component to the fourth is three over d squared. This three is coming because you have random numbers from a Gaussian distribution. Okay. So again, you saw that when we were talking about the spectrum, it was nice to have a number. So I could say this number indicates Vignodice. This number indicates a Poisson. Now with the eigenstates, again, it's nice to have a number that I can say, oh, this should be a random vector. Okay. So one of these quantities to study these um, vectors is the participation ratio. Definition, one over the sum of all of those components to the fourth. And so you see that if all of these components were equal, which will never happen, okay, but if they were all equal, uh, you would have each one you know, would be the square root of one of the dimensions. So this would give us dimension. You know, the participation ratio becomes the dimension. If all of the states, all of the components were equal. If your eigenstate was the basis that you chose, then each eigenstate gives you just one. So you have these extreme values. Participation ratio one means eigenstate is equal to the basis. Participation ratio dimension means we have uh, the, the most delocalized state. What do we have for this GOE random matrices? This is three over D squared, right? So the participation ratio is dimension divided by three. So this three is coming because we are playing with random numbers from a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so we have the participation ratio. If I compute this participation ratio for each eigenstate that I have in this big matrix, each one, they will all give us this dimension over three. So what I'm showing to you here is a single matrix of dimensions 3000, just to show that all states are equivalent. We got the dimension divided by three. Again, you will see these fluctuations. If you do averages, it's going to become, um, you can reduce these fluctuations and see this thinking becoming really uh, flat. Okay. Conclusion, all the eigenstates of random matrices are just random vectors, they are equivalent. Okay. The other quantities, how tired are you? You're still awake, no, I see people connected, good. So there are other quantities that, um, we can use, again, uh, to give a number for these states. It could be the log of that uh, participation ratio. It's an entropy. Huh? It's like a second order any entropy, but not perhaps what you've heard about the entanglement entropy or you had to trace out some degrees of freedom. No, it's just the Rennie entropy associated with all the components of the state. And uh, so some people now call this like a participation Rennie entropy because it's how many states participate in your state. Or we can use those components to, to get some kind of um, uh, first order Rennie entropy. All these are numbers, okay? In, in random matrices, in uh, uh, quantum chaos, people also studied the distribution of the weights of those components, what they call Porter-Thomas uh, distribution. Okay, and then I'm going to skip the entanglement entropy. Perhaps uh, you will hear about it in other lectures, okay? So there, another problem for you. <laughs> so try to reproduce this plot. No, you, you already got your matrix, you got the eigenvalues, you made the semicircle, you computed uh, level statistics, either with the R, with the S, and then also get the eigenstates and check if you get that. Okay, so once you, you did this, you have a good understanding of, um, uh, you, you already can deal with random matrices, no problem. All right, story of thermalization. So that's why I would like you to be awake. <laughs> yeah, so then I can conclude with the story of thermalization. Okay. Go back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, good. So what I did there is I have a matrix size 3000. I diagonalize. 
So now I have 3,000 eigenstates. All of them, as I said, are just random vectors. Okay, so then I pick each one and I compute that participation ratio. So I got a number. And I told you that this number should be close to dimension divided by three. So in our case, it should be close to a thousand. But I repeat that for each one of those states. So I got something very close to a thousand for each one of these states. So this is what I'm plotting here. This is one dot here is one state, another dot is another state and so on. And so you see that they are all very close to this dimension divided by three. That's it. Yeah. So for the random matrices, what you're thinking is correct. You could have a vector where, I don't know, uh, there are some guys here who, with uh, larger values and some zeros around. Yeah? But in random matrices, all of them are equivalent. All of them are random numbers. Now, so if you compute this, it's approximately one over the dimension. So that's what this figure is showing, that all of them are equivalent, random vectors. Question. Yeah, whenever you start putting correlations there, which is what is going to happen when we have a real systems, then you will never have something that is exactly a random vector. But what we try to say is that the system is strongly chaotic. If we got a good Wigner Dyson distribution, the levels are very much correlated in the middle of the spectrum, not at the edges, but in the middle of the spectrum, the states will be close to random vectors, never equal. Okay, so when we talk about ergodicity, and this term is very much used to talk about these chaotic states, uh, is Perhaps we should call it quasi-ergodicity because it's never going to be like random matrices. Yeah. Question. In, okay, very good question. In random matrices, basis is not even defined. No, we just fill the matrix with random numbers. In real systems, yes, it depends a lot on the basis. Yeah. Which basis are we going to use? Then depends on the question that you're after. If you're start trying to study, I don't know, localization in real space, which is what many people are doing, then you pick the basis that will tell you about localization in real space. Yeah. So it depends on the question then. So how are you to go for thermalization in 10 minutes or 15, perhaps? Ready? No, you can sleep. I'm asking the students. <laughs> we can repeat again tomorrow, but just to give you a flavor. Yeah? Or shall I continue? Okay. Huh? We can thermalize the rest of the We can thermalize it. Okay. I will repeat it tomorrow again, okay? But what is the story? I have an observable and I let it evolve. I'm going to write this evolved state in terms of the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian that is evolving the system. So as we had seen in that spectral form factor, we get these phases, no? which is caused by the evolution. But um, this C alpha here is the projection of my initial state in the energy eigenbase. So we have these components of the initial state, we have the phases, and we have now this observable here in the sandwich between the eigenstates. Fine. And uh, so this is the evolution of my observable written in this energy eigenbases. And you see that I separated when alpha and beta are different from the point when alpha and beta are equal. Just as we talked about in the spectral form factor, this is 
the saturation value. If I wait long enough, I'll reach this point. Okay? And this part is the time evolution that has the whole transient before we get there. All right? Okay, so whatever evolution we had, we'll reach a point where we have just these fluctuations around that value. Once we reach this point, that's what we are calling equilibration first. Um, remember, as we already said, we are thinking about many body systems. So we have many, many different phases here. That's what is bringing us to this saturation value. So that's what allows us to talk about equilibration. There are fluctuations, but they are small. And they will become smaller and smaller as you make this system bigger and bigger. Okay, so we reached this point, this infinite time average. Okay. Exactly. But if I'm thinking about random matrix, we know there are no degeneracies. If I'm thinking about a physical system that is similar to random matrix, I don't have degeneracies. No? So in these um, many body systems, we'll have so many faces there and um, so little degeneracies that that thing will give us just these small fluctuations. Okay, so now the question, so this is equilibration or relaxation. The question now is, we reach this point, this equilibrium value, we want to know if this is thermal equilibrium or not. So the question is, this infinite time average I'm putting here, we want to know whether this coincides with some average from a thermodynamic ensemble. All right, so what I did here is a, a, a microcanonical ensemble, just an average of these expectation values in a small window of energy. And then you may wonder, okay, how can this part, which has the components of the initial state here, how can this agree with this average in a small window? Okay. What is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, no ETH? What does it tell us? It tells us, well, if this expectation value here, no? so I computed this expectation value like this. So if this expectation value does not change for different eigenstates closing energy, no? so if I compute this expectation value with one eigenstate, then I compute this expectation with another eigenstate, and they all giving me close values, I can take this guy out of this sum. I can say that one eigenstate should agree with this average. Did you understand? Should I repeat? Let's repeat. So ETH eigenstate, so it's talking, talking about one eigenstate, eigenstate hypothesis, no? is telling us that left side and right side will agree if the expectation value, if this calculation here obtained for one eigenstate agrees with the average, you know, or if this expectation value for one eigenstate for, will agree with the expectation value for another eigenstate or another eigenstate. You know? If all of these guys are very close so if they're all very close, a certain number that is very close, well, this becomes a number that I can take out of this, this sum. More or less, I can repeat. I see some people nodding. Okay, so then my question for you. Which kind of state will guarantee that this value will always be very similar based on what we talked about now? If we have random vectors, of course, all of these numbers will be very similar. And so that's the point with random matrices. This is trivial. If all these states are just random vectors, I can pick any and I'll get the, a very similar value here, apart from small fluctuations. 
and uh, how these fluctuations decrease, I pick vectors that are bigger and bigger. So these fluctuations become smaller and smaller. So this whole idea of one eigenstate agrees with the average is trivial if I have random matrices. All of the eigenstates are random vectors. Okay. So in random matrices, ETH is a trivial statement. One agrees with the average, of course, because one, any one is all random vectors. And so the uh, what will guarantee ETH is having these chaotic states. So in random matrices, it's trivial. The question becomes more interesting when we move to physical systems, because as we were already talking before, well, in physical systems, do we have these random vectors? Not really. You don't have perfect random vectors. You will have something close to random vectors in the middle of the spectrum, but they will not be perfect random vectors. Mm -hmm. But if you're playing just with few body observables, these few body observables will not be able to detect that these are not perfect random vectors. Got the idea more or less? Do you want to ask something? I can repeat this story about ETH again tomorrow. So it's think about it and then uh, come with questions perhaps tomorrow. Okay, so it's, I think, time to finish. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so there are any more questions? Can you take this the point of the 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 like you can quantify the scale of uh, lambda, whatever the value is. Mm. But in level splitting, do you have any um, like any scale which corresponds to lambda in class? No, but uh, what uh, I will try to tell you about this tomorrow. What uh, people started talking about is uh, I have a slide here, but it's many slides later. <laughs> Let me see if I find it. But it's um, Okay. Okay. So what you just uh, we just talked about the positive Lyapunov exponent, which is associated with the sensitivity to initial conditions. Now this equation that we we have here we can write as a, a Poisson bracket in classical mechanics. Okay. Well, if you now move to quantum mechanics, instead of the Poisson bracket, you can have a commutator. And people started studying these uh, commutators, uh, how they evolve in time. Yeah? And what, what people have saw, saw is that there is this commutator grows in time with the same rate of the classical Lyapunov exponent. Yeah? So that's what some people call the quantum Lyapunov exponent. So the correspondence with the classical Lyapunov exponent come with this, um, it's called out of time order correlated, comes with this quantity uh, as you study dynamics. Okay? And since you asked, you see, this growth of this commutator, which can be exponential when we have a chaotic system, where this rate will coincide with the Lyapunov exponent is something that shows up at very short times. It's whew, this exponential growth. Now, lab with statistics, if you want to detect that in the dynamics, we saw that it shows up at long times. And so what is quantum chaos? Is it level statistics or is this exponential growth in the beginning? That's a question that I'll put to you. <laughs> and I don't have an answer, yeah? Yeah, so the ramp, we, the ramp is a reflection of level statistics, of correlated eigenvalues. So it's eigenvalues, and this shows up at long times. This feature is the spread of the commutator at short times, so two very different time scales. Is this chaos or is it level repulsion chaos? Yeah? Question. Uh, 
point correct to say that for the ideal hypothesis to be applicable in a energy eigen states as to be random eigen then it's for sure. Now, when we move to real systems, you don't have random vectors anymore. You have something close. If the system is strongly chaotic, then yes. Th then that uh, statement becomes easy to understand why one coincides with the average, because each one is, is giving us very similar results. There. We can distinguish uh, ergodic, you said, and non-ergodic, no. like chaos and non-k. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, is there a case that some eigenshift showing some random eigenshift, but uh, in the middle of the spectrum or some of uh, other spectrum, in the whole spectrum, I'm saying, uh, the some eigenshift are uh, showing some random vectors like uh, chaos, theoretical form, and some eigenshift you you are somewhere in between then yeah. no it, it, that's what uh, people would say fractal multifractal kind of state so what i'm showing here is like when the eth is guaranteed no? uh, if you have anything in between then some people will call weak eth and weak thermalization yeah okay but i'm showing the trivial case the participation ratio, yes. The participation ratio will tell us if we have uh, uh, random vectors or if we are in this scenario multifractality. I also have slides for this uh, that I was planning to show tomorrow. But the idea is simple. Okay, I don't know if I can keep speaking. Okay, so we talked about participation ratio, no? one over that sum. We can also talk about inverse participation ratio, which is just that sum no? for each state that uh, we selected. Um, if this IPR is proportional to the dimension of our Hilbert space, no? um, so with a factor here, minus one equ equivalent, if this is proportional to the dimension, then we have something very close to the random vectors. Uh, it's like a chaos or ergodic. But we could have this proportional to this dimension with, with what we call D2. It's the, this is the fractal dimension. So if this is between zero and one, then we are in, in this scenario that you're talking about. And then finally, if this does not uh, change no, with, with the dimension, then that's localization. So this is a very nice area to study. There was, uh, you had a question. So we're talking about very good. <laughs> okay. So you're anticipating everything that I was planning to tell you. If you look at the density of states of these many body systems, but the real ones, when you have two body couplings, or three body, if you think about random matrices, you will see that the density of states is like this, a Gaussian distribution. I can explain it to you where this comes from, but it's just combinatorics. Okay, so most levels in these systems are here. Now, so if you would look at the, the spectrum, you have some, and then in the middle, many, 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 and then some, okay, that's one. So here, is when all these guys can mix and you can get those big superpositions, those big um, vectors, where the components will be close, but never really random numbers. So, so the, the part, if you look at the participation ratio, no, the, here it will be large. 
And so here in the middle, we have chaos. Here we have thermalization. At the edges, no. In physical systems. So that's very important. No? In physical systems, we have this dependence, this energy dependence that is very important. So everything that is close to random matrices is here. Ah, so here you don't even need a state. No? Uh, oh, uh, no, I see what you're saying. I thought you were talking about initial state. So the the average here, uh, we do um, like middle of the spectrum. We didn't. We never did ground state. In ground state could be an issue here if you're studying chaos because you don't have uh, chaos usually at low levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if there are no more questions, so please let us thank Leah again.